Okay, we're going to finish up chapter 40 and then move on to 41. So just a couple more things here. So, um, again, living things need to maintain homeostasis and um, their metabolism is how they do that. And um, of course, in our part of our metabolism is, of course, taking in these foods, digesting those foods, breaking them down, absorbing those uh, materials, using some of them to build things, using a lot of it for cellular respiration. Uh, and in each of these steps, we're going to generate heat through these metabolic processes. And of course, some of the energy is going to be lost as solid waste materials. And so, of course, in a endothermic organism, there's a lot of this heat generated as part of maintaining our, our body temperature, and it's through the metabolism and the processing of these materials that we do this. <clears throat> and so when we look at metabolism, we see there are definitely some relationships between uh, size and metabolic rate, such that, probably not too surprisingly, a, an elephant um, has a greater metabolism than a shrew or a mouse, and that is as measured by oxygen use. They essentially use a lot more oxygen than your typical shrew or mouse. They are, of course, also a whole lot bigger than a shrew or a mouse. Now, when you look at it on a per kilogram basis, though, that is per unit mass, we see the shrew actually has a much a higher, much larger, much greater metabolism than the elephants. That is, per unit body mass, the elephant is not burning up as much energy, not using up as much oxygen as your typical shrew. So it's interesting that this one is relatively linear, but this is a quite exponential decay here. That is, really small mammals have a high metabolism, your mouse, your shrew, but then it quickly drops off as we get to larger and larger organisms. Um, <coughs> And um, allocation of resources to activities can vary amongst different types. So here, in particular, we're looking at uh, reproduction. And of course, we have, a, we have a, a human, a penguin, a bird, a mouse, and a snake, a reptile. And so this looks at the overall energy needed in a given year. That is kilocalories per year, 800,000 for the mammal, 340, et cetera, et cetera. And so, of course, the human is a lot bigger than a mouse, so it needs a lot more calories to do its thing. But um, we see that the human allocates much more of its resources to just its basal or baseline metabolism, more so than a mouse. Whereas a mouse has to put a whole lot more into temperature regulation compared to the human. Uh, and, and a, a bit more to reproduction than the human as a proportion, on a proportional basis. And so why is it that this mouse has to generate so much heat? Why does it have to put so much energy into heat? Well, the mouse is a lot smaller organism, and so it has a much greater surface-to-volume ratio. It has more surface area relative to its volume than a human does, or say even an elephant, of course. And so that's going to allow more heat to escape from that organism, and so it's going to have to generate more heat to stay warm. And that's that same way with the shrew. The shrew is just about one of the smallest mammals around, and so it has to generate a lot of heat in order to stay warm, for example. And of course, you can see temperature regulation doesn't even show up in the, uh, the snake's one because it's an ectotherm, so it just relies on external heat for the most part. Um, all right, but then when we put it on a per kilogram basis, an energy expenditure or energy needs, of course, we see that the mouse has much greater energy needs per unit mass. So it's going to have to eat a lot of food relative to its, its weight on a daily basis compared to the human and definitely compared to the snake. On a per, per gram or per kilogram basis here, you can see the, the snake doesn't have to eat much at all. Really slow metabolism. and That's why a large snake, or any snake for that matter, can eat a meal and then not eat for days and days, or in a large snake, probably even weeks and weeks, and it'll be just fine. All right, mm, speaking of eating, that leads us into animal nutrition, chapter 41. So when you eat, you're fulfilling several needs. 
course, you're getting energy to do the work that your body needs to do. You're getting the raw materials you need to make things inside you to make new compounds, new you, if you will. And you also need to get certain essential nutrients in your diet beyond just the calories that you need. And we'll take a look at these here. So, for example, we know that we need amino acids uh, to build up the nucleic acids we have and for other purposes. And there's 20 of them in total. Well, these eight are known as the essential amino acids because they're amino acids your body can't synthesize. The other 12, your body can take raw materials and make those amino acids, but not these eight. And <clears throat> we have the corn and the beans here because this is to sort of show that if, if you're a, a vegetarian, uh, you need to get these eight essential amino acids in your diet and you have to get them from these at least two different sources. If, you're, if you eat meat, you're going to get all 20 from eating meat, whether it's chicken, beef, or fish. But if you're a vegetarian, you have to make sure you get these eight essential amino acids in your diet, otherwise you will be malnourished. And so what is the difference between a vitamin and a mineral? Well, a vitamin, like vitamin C here, is an organic compound, carbon-based compound, that again is essential to good nutrition and as you see a lot of these vitamins are coenzymes they are enzymes that help other enzymes in particular metabolic processes and if you don't get enough of them there can be certain deficiencies such as uh, a lot of people know about scurvy that's a lack of vitamin c in your diet which causes problems with your skin and teeth and gums and overall health um, and in some cases, you can get too much of these things. Apparently, too much niacin will possibly cause liver damage. And there's various sources for these things, as you can see. Um, legumes here, good source of biotin. And vitamin D. Vitamin D is kind of interesting because um, that's the one that you make just by being out in the sunlight. You can synthesize it. Your body can synthesize it, as well as getting it from dairy products and egg. Dairy products, in particular, are supplemented with vitamin D because vitamin D deficiency is sometimes a problem, particularly with modern society and people getting out in the sun less than they used to. All right, whereas a mineral is a particular element that you will find in particular compounds that are in your diet, you're, you're typically not just ingesting pure chlorine or sulfur or anything like that. In fact, pure chlorine would be probably toxic to you, but you're getting it in different compounds, like obviously you're getting sodium chloride. You get those two together in table salt. Um, fluorine is an interesting one. We know it's good for maintenance of your teeth and um, drinking water is often supplemented in communities with fluorine. All right. So again, you need to get proper nutrition. If you're not getting enough calories, you are undernourished or you're basically on a starvation diet. Whereas if you're not getting the right amounts of certain things, you can be malnourished. This is a condition where these guys do not have enough protein in their diet. And so in the process of um, taking in foods, we have to do several things. First, of course, you have to take it in one way or another. You have to eat it. And then you begin chemical digestion, breaking it down, and in addition to mechanical breaking it down by chewing it. And then you have to absorb those digested nutrients and then finally get rid of the waste, things that you don't digest. And so those are the steps, ingestion, digestion, absorption, and elimination. Now with ingestion, that can occur by several mechanisms. Um, you can be a bulk feeder where you just kind of eat the whole organism or large chunks of the organism, sometimes chewing it, sometimes not. We're basically bulk feeders, but we, we chew our food, whereas, of course, this python does not. It's just going to swallow this deer whole. Um, fluid feeders, like uh, mosquitoes or leeches, they're just consuming body fluids of other organisms. Um, suspension or filter feeders, um, see, these are things that are found in the water, and they just use um, things like this baleen, which is the structure that baleen whales have to filter krill out of the water, for example. Substrate feeders, like this caterpillar, it's just basically eating its way through its food. Um, imagine if you were in a giant Twinkie and you were just eating your way through it. You would, I guess, be considered a substrate feeder at that point. Okay, 
So now you've ingested it. So now you need to begin breaking it down, begin digesting it. And um, this happens various ways in organisms, like this hydra here has a gastrovascular cavity, where there are these cells that line that, that release these digestive enzymes into the cavity and begin breaking it, that food down. Um, others have a complete digestive tract, where they ingest their food and it travels along with various things happening to it. Uh, like this worm or the cropping gizzard there where, where food is churned up and begin breaking it into smaller pieces. Um, and then an intestine, of course, where absorption occurs and then the back end where it's uh, eliminated. Ours is um, perhaps a little more complicated than earthworm. Of course, we have teeth where we begin the breakdown process and we have salivary glands that release certain enzymes where even, even a little bit of... Uh, uh, digestion occurs, begins occurring in your in your mouth just a little bit. Esophagus, this tube that runs down to your to your stomach. Stomach, where digestion begins in earnest. Lots of enzymes released from the epithelial cells in your stomach. This muscle that kind of churns up that food, and then into the small intestine, where a lot of the bulk of the absorption of nutrients occurs. Uh, the large intestine, where a little more absorption, particularly water, occurs. And then finally, elimination. <clears throat> we'll get to the liver and pancreas in just a second here. Of course, again, up in your mouth where you chew on it, where the process of digestion begins. Um, your tongue plays an interesting role here in that your tongue sort of helps you manipulate that chew food that you're chewing up and also the process of swallowing it. Your tongue moves to the back of your throat as you're swallowing. And that's an important process because that causes this thing, the epiglottis, to cover your trachea so that the food goes down to your esophagus and not your trachea. We've all at some point experienced this unpleasant process of having some bit of food go down your trachea and we have an instant coughing reaction. Our body responds involuntarily to get that food out of the trachea because you don't want to choke on it. All right, here, the esophagus, those smooth muscles, this, this series of contractions that in addition to gravity, helps get that food down to your stomach. Those epithelial cells, particularly these pits, all lined with epithelial tissue, whose job is to secrete digestive enzymes and also acids, hydrochloric acid, to lower the pH because a low pH is ideal for this enzyme in particular, pepsinogen, to be converted into pepsin, which helps to, as you can imagine, pep digest, start, begin the process of digesting some polypeptides. Um, the liver and pancreas play a significant role in, uh, in um, digestion and absorption of nutrients as well. Um, the liver secretes bile, from which is stored in the gallbladder, which is important with emulsifying and, and breaking down fats. And let's look here. So this is sort of the complete picture um, so here's the food you're consuming, carbohydrates, proteins, nucleic acids, fats. Of course, carbs, proteins, and, and lipids or fats are the ones you typically see on nutrition labels. You don't see nucleic acids there, but of course they are in the foods you eat. Um, carbohydrates begins up in the mouth with the um, salivary amylase, this enzyme from in your saliva that helps break down sugars. Again, we talked about pepsin in the stomach. That's where the digestion of polypeptides begins. And then after the food has really been churned up is where digestion begins in earnest and then absorption as well in your small intestine where all of these things, again, more sugars being digested, polypeptides, nucleic acids. There's the bile that helps emulsify the fats and then you have enzymes which help to break down those fats. <clears throat> And also, the pancreas releases buffers that helps to neutralize this solution, this acid chyme coming out of your stomach. Um, it's, again, it's really acidic in the stomach, but the intestine doesn't tolerate that so well, so you release, again, buffers from the pancreas. Going back a moment, um, if you've ever heard of, uh, of um, indigestion or heartburn, what's happening there is that's when this acid chyme is coming back up into your esophagus and irritating your esophagus. This is in proximity to your heart, thus we think of it as heartburn, but it's really just this acid material 
irritating the lining of your esophagus.